The 911 call you just heard would be the starting point to one of the most baffling murder cases I think I may have ever heard. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Lake Oconee murders. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> <laughs> Russell Joseph Dermond was born on June 6, 1925 in Hackensack, New Jersey. Russell would spend the majority of his first half of his life in New Jersey. He would eventually go on to serve in the U.S. Navy uh, during World War II, and he would also, on his free time, love to golf. He was considered an avid reader, um, and he would never pass up a leisurely walk around the neighborhood. Most importantly, Russell Dermond was a family man. He loved being around and spending time with his friends and his family, especially with his wife, Shirley. Shirley was born as Shirley Bell Wilcox on July 7th, 1926 in Maywood, New Jersey. Shirley was described as just the motherly type. She did have kids, but she would be like this kind of fill-in mother for anyone and everyone who needed that. She was described as someone who had just like the gentlest soul and the kindest of hearts. She also loved to do crossword puzzles. She was basically an expert at them. Um, she had a green thumb. She loved spending hours in her garden. And from what I hear, she played a pretty mean game of bridge. So Russell and Shirley would meet in college. I'm not exactly sure what year they met specifically, but by 1950, the two of them would get married. They would go on to have four children, Mark, Bradley, Keith, and Leslie. And then through them, they would go on to have nine grandchildren. Their son, Mark, was tragically killed in 2000. He was actually murdered uh, during an attempted uh, drug sale. This obviously devastated the whole family and it took a huge toll on, you know, on Russell and Shirley um, because, you know, through all of his, you know, issues, they loved their son. Now, eventually the Dermans would move um, away from New Jersey and they would actually go out to Atlanta, Georgia. There, Russell would end up uh, franchising several Hardee's restaurants. And to those who may not be familiar, Hardee's is basically uh, Carl's Jr. Um, so like here in Arizona, we have Carl's Jr.'s, we don't have Hardee's, but Hardee's is basically the same exact place. Um, they have the same logo, the same star and everything. They're owned by the same company. But Russell had purchased like a whole bunch of them. Through that, they became very wealthy. They became very comfortable financially. While uh, Russell was, you know, operating, you know, the franchises, um, Shirley was a stay-at-home mom. And it's something she just absolutely loved to do. She loved spending time with her kids. Um, and she was an amazing mother and she raised them to be great kids. Eventually the kids would become adults and then they would get married and, you know, have the grandkids. So it was just a big, happy family. By 1994, Russell would end up retiring. He sold off all of the franchises of Hardee's he had and he retired and him and Shirley would actually move to a gated community um, about 40 miles away from Atlanta. The community was called Great Waters, and it was just off of Lake Oconee. The neighborhood they lived in was extremely quiet. Um, it was sort of just nestled away, kind of like in the trees, <laughs> basically. It was very, uh, it was also a very wealthy neighborhood. I mean, every single home there is a multi-million dollar home. All beautiful, gorgeous, with like... Most of them have access directly to the lake. They have their own docks. They have their own boats. Um, so this is a very well-to-do neighborhood. 
the Germans were no exception. They owned a absolutely beautiful home. Um, it's basically a mansion, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> and the Dermans' house was very, like, tucked away. It was kind of just, uh, just off in a very secluded area of the neighborhood. It was very difficult to, like, just stumble onto this house, um, which was great for security. Speaking of security, this was a neighborhood and a part of, of, of Georgia that really had no issues with crime. Um, there was never any break-ins uh, in this neighborhood. There was never any, like, nefarious residents. Um, it was just a very chill, calm place where nothing ever seemed to go wrong or off the rails. Like I said, it was a gated community, so they had like this uh, big security house type thing right up front by the gate, and I believe it only has one actual gate to get in and out of by car. Um, now, the security uh, place also had cameras pointing at basically everyone coming and going in their cars. But when this case happens, there was like a, a recent uh, weather incident that caused the cameras to malfunction, so they were not working during this particular case. According to the sheriff, um, who was eventually in charge of this case that we're about to get into, um, back then, when this happened, the security was very, very lax. Um, essentially, they would just sort of wave people in, they would have to open the gate for them, but anyone who had like this decal, a specific decal on their window, it was just like, come on in. And this included like delivery drivers and uh, people who did maintenance in the neighborhood. They all had this decal, so they weren't really questioned by security. They were just like waved in. Uh, the only other way to get into this neighborhood was by Lake Oconee. Um, and that obviously wasn't gated. So it was basically like sneaking in the back door if you needed to sneak in. But Lake Oconee um, was and still is a very popular lake for like party goers, for uh, relaxation, for fishing. Um, so there was usually some pretty heavy traffic on the lake. And the lake itself is over 1900 acres. So it's, it's big. Okay, so on May 3rd, 2014, Russell and Shirley Dermond were invited to and expected to attend a Kentucky Derby party over at a neighbor's house. However, Russell and Shirley, they never showed up to the party, which for them would be extremely unusual because one, they were very punctual people. Two, they never bailed on anyone. Three, if they were going to bail, they would always call and let the people know ahead of time, like, hey, we're not gonna make it but they never called the friend to let them know they're not gonna get there. So Russell and Shirley, who by the way, had been married for over 60 years at this point, were no-shows. And at the time, it didn't like raise any red flags to the friends or neighbors. They just thought, okay, maybe they got ill. Maybe they fell sick and they just, they'll call later perhaps. But again, that call later also never happened. So a few days later, um, on May 6, 2014, the neighbor who was who had the Kentucky Derby party, um, along with her husband and another neighbor, I believe, growing concerned that they still hadn't heard from or seen Russell and Shirley at all, uh, they would go over to the Dermans' house and knock on the door. But when they did, nobody answered. Um, they started to kind of like look in the windows to see if anything was like out of place. Nothing seemed unusual. Um, they didn't see any signs of Russell and Shirley. Uh, they were calling their names, nothing. They went around to like the dock. They did, their boat was still there. Um, they didn't see anything in the lawn. It was just their normal, quiet, peaceful house. And, but, but where were Russell and Shirley? So one of the neighbors decided to try the door. Uh, they, she turned the doorknob and it opened, which would be very unusual because Russell and Shirley were known to always have their doors locked. Um, so that right there was like their first like, uh-oh. Um, so they opened the door, called out their names, nobody answered. So they decided, you know what, we're concerned, something is wrong, something feels off. They go into the home. They begin searching and one of them will kind of veer off to the side and go through the garage door. 
And that's when they discover... Well, that's when the nightmare begins. They made a discovery that I would hope no one would ever in their lives have to experience. Lying on the ground in the garage was 88-year-old Russell Dermond. At first glance, they noticed that there were some bunched up towels kind of where like over his neck. Um, and then there was this big pool of blood surrounding where his head was, or I should say where his head should have been. Because when they walked closer, the towels weren't covering his head because Russell had been decapitated. His head was gone. It was nowhere in the garage. So the neighbors obviously call 911 and that was the 911 call I played towards the beginning of the video. Hello. Have a penny 911. Yes, I have an emergency. Okay. I think I had somebody dead. Who is it? The Germans. I just came to check on them. They've been missing for about four days. Are they in the house? Yes, yes. After police arrived, they did a uh, check of the entire house. Shirley Dermond was nowhere to be found. So they would presume that Shirley was either kidnapped or is it possible that Shirley was somehow involved in what happened to Russell and then she fled the scene? Unlikely, but they had to process that thought because you just never know. The house itself had no signs of forced entry. Uh, there was no sign of any struggle. There, It was just like they opened the door and then whoever they let in is who did this to Russell. Now, obviously, if you're going to decapitate someone, you're likely going to see, because when you lift up whatever weapon you're using, or if you're sawing, you're going to see like blood spatter. Um, but there was none. There was no blood spatter anywhere in the house. There was no cast off blood stains anywhere in the house. The only blood that was in the house at all was the pool of blood that was surrounding um, Russell's neck. So, and they would also eventually spray luminol. They would look around the house, you know, with the, with the cool goggles and turn off the lights. And there were no signs of blood anywhere else in the house. There was no signs that someone had cleaned up blood. Like, you know, when they do the luminol and you can see like the wipes, the wipe stains, like you'd always see on like forensic files or something. Um, there was none of that. So what the heck, how did this happen to Russell and there will be no blood anywhere? Investigators thought, they believe, that the towels were kind of bunched up around Russell's neck in order to prevent it from the blood to seep out of the garage and call attention to itself. The towels were there to basically soak up the blood um, so that way, whoever did this had time to get away and get away very, very far before anyone would notice what happened in the garage. In the house itself, they obviously processed it like you would any crime scene. They did a very thorough job. Um, the police work on this one, by all accounts that I've read and I've seen, the, the police work was really, really good. Um, they were very thorough about collecting any evidence they could. Uh, but that being said, there were no traces of foreign DNA, so the only DNA they found was Russell's. There were tons of fingerprints all over the house, but if they weren't matching Russell and Shirley, they were kind of like foreign fingerprints that they never matched anyone to. But keep in mind, this is, you know, a house where there's, again, the family has nine grandkids. They have four or three children. Um, that have always been in and out of the house, you know, and friends and family gatherings. So you're probably not going to have any luck with the fingerprints, but... So they actually needed to confirm first that the body was in fact that of Russell Dermond because obviously his head was not there. So they took his fingerprints and they processed it against known fingerprints of things in the house and they confirmed that it was in fact Russell Dermond. The medical examiner uh, noticed when they were processing evidence on, because Russell had all of his clothes on, he had his shoes on and everything, um, on his collar of his shirt there was some gunshot residue, uh, which was weird because everything from his, obviously, neck below, there were no gunshot wounds. There were no bullet holes anywhere in the house. Um, no 
no like bullet like markings on the ground or anything. So what they would come to the conclusion is, and they can't confirm this, but uh, they believe that Russell was likely shot in the head and that the bullet basically did not come out the other end. So the killer thinking, well, they could possibly trace the bullet back to me or whoever did it. Um, and so they probably have the idea of, well, now I need to cut off his head so that I can hide the evidence of the bullet. My neck started itching. Ugh. I like, get that weird, like, that feeling, you know, like I'm talking about decapitation. It's like, ugh. So other than Russell's body, they, they had nothing, they had no evidence. They had nothing to collect. I mean, there weren't even like uh, valuable like shoe impressions or anything like that. No hair samples, nothing that was left behind from the killers. And not to mention, where the hell is Shirley? They, you know, they put out, a, you know, a, a kidnapped poster for Shirley thinking that she was kidnapped. Um, and they, of course, they were searching all over. They searched the neighborhood. They searched, they went door to door. They looked everywhere and anywhere they could, but they just couldn't find her. Where, where is Shirley? What happened to her? At one point, I, I was reading a, a, an article. There was like a quote from a family member that says, that says like, I know this is grim, but I, I hope that she is dead because I hope she's not somewhere suffering at the hands of some kidnappers, like she's not being tortured or something. Um, or I hope she is dead and not the even worse of like, she's the killer kind of thing. But Shirley's this sweet 87 year old elderly woman. She's not gonna cut off someone's head and get away with it. Um, no offense to any 87 year olds out there, but it just, it's just not, it's not a likely scenario. <laughs> so obviously, something bad had to have happened to Shirley. You know, so police were like, do we wait for a ransom call? What do we do? Like, is someone gonna call in and demand a billion dollars and we'll return Shirley? They had the family uh, go through the entire house top to bottom because they wanted to find out if this was possibly a robbery, but everything was still there. There was literally not a single thing missing. Um, you know, this is a family who had expensive watches and jewelry and they had cash in the house. They had expensive, you know, sellable trinkets and things. They had electronics like laptop computers, like new ones, um, brand new TVs. Nothing was stolen. Not a single thing. Even the car keys were left out. This wasn't even like a plot to steal a car because both of their cars were in the garage with Russell. Russell and Shirley never called attention to themselves. They were very, very humble people. They had a lot of money. Yes, they had a humongous house. But other than that, they never like flaunted their wealth. They never bragged. They never rubbed it in anyone's faces. Uh, it, they were just such a, a wholesome uh, married couple. They looked into like their past. They had no known enemies. Um, you know, the Hardys thing, they, the, Russell had sold the business over 20 years prior. Um, and so there was no bad blood with like any like ex, you know, uh, business partners. There was like no uh, people who were like got fired by Russell and then 20 years later they exact revenge. Um, it's possible, yes, don't get me wrong but they, they, they couldn't find any signs of anything like that um, at all. Russell and Shirley m married at a fairly young age um, and there were no exes in their past, right? There were no like affairs that happened. Um, so there was no jilted lover, like none of that either. <laughs> so uh, stumped investigators begin to look into the last couple days of Russell and Shirley's life. On the morning of May 1st, 2014, they saw that Russell had gone to his bank. He made like a quick little like a uh, deposit or a payment, like a sm very small amount. And the people there said, yeah, he seemed like in totally good spirits. Nothing seemed wrong. Um, he left the bank. And then there was CCTV footage of Russell at a uh, Publix grocery store. This is the last known image of Russell Dermond. It was caught at 2.38 p.m. on that May 1st. 
he, as he was checking out, there was also another image of him leaving. He bought like, I think a cucumber and some milk or something. Like he bought two very just basic items that he always would buy. Again, everyone there, they question. He seemed normal. He was happy. He was smiling. He was joking around with the people. All, all normal. They also believe the couple was still there and unharmed on the morning, at least the morning of May 2nd, because the newspaper from May 2nd was in the house and it was opened as if someone was reading it. Could this have been the killer? Sure, but it doesn't seem likely given the, the crime scene being so clean and like not messed around. Um, plus the crossword puzzle was filled out and Shirley was, she loved doing crossword puzzles and she was great at them. Um, so they're like, okay, so they, they must have been there in the morning. And then a little bit later, the police would invest to find out that, uh, Russell had opened up an email that was sent from one of his kids. So they know he was alive then. So sometime between the mid afternoon of May 2nd, 2014, and the night of the Kentucky Derby party, which would be the May 3rd, which is supposed to start sometime around 6 or 6.30. So in that little window of time is when this probably happened. There was one witness who was on the, the lake fishing or something like that. And on the morning of, or the afternoon, I'm sorry, of May 3rd, 2014, they would tell police that they saw what looked like a gentleman on the kind of the back lawn where the, the dock was for the Dermans house. Um, a gentleman whose face they couldn't see, unfortunately, because they were just too far away. Um, but it looked like this person was sort of like in a hurried kind of like back and forth moving around a lot. Didn't seem like Russell's behavior. Um, so police believe that this witness saw the actual killer. Um, but unfortunately, there, there was no composite made because the, the person didn't get a good look at him. So the coroner would determine that Russell was definitely deceased before he was decapitated. So his cause of death was not the decapitation, um, which gives more credence to the fact that he was either shot in the head or he could have possibly been strangled. But where the, the cut, by the way, on his neck was, they said was extremely clean and it was done very professionally for whatever I guess that means, um, as if someone may have done this before. Um, but they didn't notice any like ligature marks where like hands would be. But again, you know, it was kind of hard to tell whether or not there would have been a strangulation. But they're still going off the theory of gunshot because of the gunshot residue on his shirt. A murder weapon was never found, um, and whatever was used to remove his head was also never found. And also, Russell Derman's head has never been found to this very day. So over the course of the next week and a half after the murder, their police again are investigating one aspect and they're also going around looking for where the hell is Shirley? Well, 10 days after they discovered Russell's body, the location of Shirley was finally found. On the morning of May 16th, 2014, a couple of fishermen had just set out on Lake Oconee to do some fishing. And they got to a point kind of mid lake, um, right where this like buoy was. And they noticed something floating in the water. Um, when they kind of got a little bit closer, it was very obvious that that thing floating was a human body. So they didn't go near it um, to not tamper with anything, but they would immediately call police and police would go out to investigate. And yes, it was a body. Um, and that body would eventually be identified as that of uh, 87 year old Shirley Dermond. She was dressed head to toe in clothing. Um, they said it was basically like Shirley got ready for the day, getting ready to go out. And then this happened. Her body was very badly decomposed um, and attached to her was this mesh bag and in the mesh bag was about 60 pounds worth of cinder blocks. Now, Shirley was not a heavy person, but 60 pounds still isn't gonna be enough to fully submerge a person underwater. So it was basically enough to, cut, to probably sink her low enough that she wouldn't have been detected for some time. But because of the state of decomposition, it would create 
again, learn this stuff from forensic files, it would create gases in the body that would eventually cause the body to rise up, even with the 60 pound weights. Police believe that this was something that the killer was not really familiar with um, because they, they thought that someone who knew what they were doing would have used a lot more weights to try to sink her to the bottom of the lake. Um, so police were like, is this something they saw in a movie and they thought this is how you do it? They don't know, but it's just, it seemed like a, a very, a rookie type thing. Oh, that sounds terrible, a rookie thing. Shirley's cause of death um, was a blunt force trauma wound, or actually three wounds, to her head. Um, they weren't 100% positive what the item was, but the wounds or the skull fractures were circular in shape or like crescent moon. So they think it was a hammer. So if like you take a hammer and you hit it solidly on the round part, you're gonna get the circle wound, but the crescent wounds is if the hammer was hit like kind of on the edge only. What's incredibly strange about this is they took no efforts to hide Russell's body. Um, as a matter of fact, it almost looked as if they specifically posed him there in the garage to be found, um, but they took extra care to hide Shirley's body. Um, they didn't know, they didn't understand why. Why would you go out of your way to hide a body, but then also pose a body to be found? But investigators would come to the conclusion that this was likely done by two people at least, because to move Shirley's body to with the boat and get the cinder blocks and all that, this is probably not a one person job. Now, again, to reiterate, there was no blood spatter in the house. There was nothing to indicate anything had gone on in the house in terms of the actual murder. So they also think Shirley must have been killed out of the house. Could that have been somewhere in the yard? Could it have been in a vehicle? They don't know. There are still no specifics on how the killer or killers got into the house at all. Because again, no forced entry. So they think this might lead them to believe that Russell let this person in the house, possibly someone they knew. But in terms of like being able to find out how they got on the property, they also don't know because again, the cameras at the security gates were not working. So they had no way of knowing if anyone unusual or out of place came in or out of the property. They had to really come to the conclusion because of the fact that they disposed of Shirley's body in the lake and that the Dermans boat was still there, uh, they must have come in through the lake itself. They must have snuck in the back way. So this person or persons probably also owns a boat or I guess they could have rented a boat. The people in the neighborhood were questioned. Uh, the sheriff said that, did they question every single person in the neighborhood? No, but they did question at one point like a hundred plus people in a single day. Um, it was, there's a lot of people who live in that neighborhood and in that general area. They couldn't possibly question every single one of them, but they, they did their damnedest. Um, and they would determine, it would appear that no one in the neighborhood did this. Can they say that conclusively? No. Most of the people who live there in the Great Waters community don't even live there permanently. This is like their summer home or their weekend home. That must be nice to have like a giant summer home like that or just to go someplace for the weekend. Were there any cameras to like that were facing the lake on anyone else's house? Maybe like someone has security cameras. Nope, none. Also, what's the profile of this person? Were they someone the Dermans knew? Were they uh, just passing by the community and decided, you know what, let's just go in there and rob someone or kill someone. They, they did toy with the idea that this could have been like a random thing, um, and that's still possible this could be a random killing, but uh, they, they said like, this is a very difficult house. Like this is like the one house in the property that's the most difficult to just like stumble onto. But that could also be the reason why they chose the house because they did stumble on it and said, oh, it's kind of tucked away. This is probably an easy target. This also appeared to be a very personal um, murder, like to cut off their head and do all that. Um, so could it have been family? Well, they did question the family. They all passed polygraph tests with flying colors, 
even on the questions of, do you know anything about what happened to them? They passed. Um, there was no indications of deception. The other reason why this is likely not family is because the only motive they would have had is money. Um, but the thing is, is if Shirley was still a missing person and not declared dead, the inheritance that the kids and the family would have gotten would not have kicked in if Shirley was still just missing. Um, so why would they go out of their way to hide her body knowing full well that, like, I can't get the money until, like, she's known dead? Um, but also, someone made note of, like, why would you wait till they're in their 80s? Um, why would you not wait until they were younger and had more money, uh, you know, at the time? So family, unlikely. Possible, sure, but... Mm, eh. Police did also look into the drug-related murder of their son, Mark, from way back, you know, in 2000. But this was 14 years prior. Um, and m there was no known connections because Mark wasn't dealing drugs. He was just trying to buy cocaine. Um, and he was caught somehow in the middle of gunfire and he was killed. Um, and then the person who shot and killed him is in prison, even at the time of the Durbin's murder. I mean, could it have been like a revenge killing for getting him in prison? Uh, again, possible, but 14 years? That's, it just seems so, it seems strange for that to be the reason and that to be the person. Could there have been some sort of like larger scope here? Like a bigger picture to look at? Was there animosity just towards the family in general? Was there animosity towards one of the Dermans' kids and so they were taking it out on the parents, maybe? But they've looked into all of those aspects. They've looked into business dealings with the family. They've looked into, you know, social media to see if there's any, like, negative, like, comments and stuff. And again, nothing. There was just, there's no evidence to support that the family or something to do with the family from the outside was involved. Can they rule it out? No. There was even a theory that the mob was involved. Yes, the mob. I think the theory came about because, you know, they were originally from New Jersey and, you know, the, the mob kind of lives there in New York and, you know, the stereotypical mob. And decapitation does seem like a very mob thing to do if you see movies like The Godfather, right? So they're like, well, maybe the body was posed the way it was because we want to send a message. But what message was that? And then what, what did they get out of it? The mob. The mob didn't do this. No one, literally no one believes. The police didn't even entertain the thoughts. It was just sort of suggested. But come on, it's not, it's not the mob. What about a serial killer? Um, again, possible. Maybe it's this unknown serial killer uh, because there was really no other known similar murders like this in that area or the surrounding area during that time um so it's again broken record here but possible likely no the biggest most uh tangible theory is that this could have been something related to possible extortion um, someone who knew the family was very wealthy. Obviously, this wasn't a secret that they were wealthy. Um, so maybe someone was trying to extort money out of the Dermans. The Dermans, uh, apparently their overall, I, I guess their estate, um, they had, they were about, worth about $2 million. So in, in like the world of multi-millionaires, they were kind of at the lower end, if you will. Um, I would love to have $2 million, but... Um, you know, maybe an extortionist thought they had a lot, lot more money, but they were, they sadly found out that they didn't. There was no unusual activity though from Russell's bank. I mean, all the money that he had in there was still there. Uh, nothing substantial changed with his bank account at all. Maybe the extortionist thought that they had something of value, of extreme value, in the home but then they were also then sadly mistaken because again they lived a fairly humble lifestyle they did have ex expensive things but not like uh, this overwhelming amount not like you know it was just like enough for them like it was just stuff that they just wanted to have that they had
but it wasn't like overflowing with like jewels and like a you know like a Scrooge McDuck with this like freaking room of gold coins you know nothing like that so perhaps the person who was trying to extort them got really pissed off that they they picked the wrong target um, and so out of anger they killed them both um, now this would have been more directed at this point if this was extortion this would have been directed solely at um, Russell, um, because Shirley wouldn't really have anything to do with any of that. So if this was the case, Shirley was just killed because she was there. There has been only one um, update uh, in, the, in the recent years, and that was actually this year, May of 2022. The investigators, um, and by the way, the sheriff is still the sheriff, and uh, he seems like a really cool guy. Uh, this is basically like the only murder case that he's investigated. He was, he's been sheriff there for a long time um, that he has not been able to solve. Um, and, I, and I think it's, he's taken it very personally, it seems like, and he wants to get this solved. Um, so he is always like working on this case kind of in the background as other cases need to be worked on too. But um, he revealed that in May of 2022, they have been, I guess, given new uh, evidence in terms of like, uh, electronic data um, specifically relating to cell phone activity for someone they have now given that data to the fbi because there is like i guess new systems in place that were not around in 2014 that the fbi are like really really uh experts at using um so as of right now as of the me making this video on october 14th 2022 there is no updates with regards to that data. Sheriff said, please don't hold out hope that this is gonna be like the Hail Mary or like, oh, it's the holy grail of this case. Like, boom, it's gonna break it wide open. I don't even, they don't even, they haven't even said who the cell phone belongs to that they're investigating. Um, whether it's a suspect they have in mind, is it Russell or Shirley's cell phones? It's, I don't know. They haven't said that. So, that is it um, in terms of where they are now. Um, and this is truly a very baffling case. Why were the Dermans targeted? What could two nearly 90 year old people possibly have done to piss someone off to cause this sort of anger? Um, what is the motive? What is the reason that someone would do this to the sweet, old couple who did not bother anyone. They were just two retirees just wanting to, to spend the remainder of their lives in peace and quiet, spend it with their grandkids, their kids. Um, why? Why did this happen? So unfortunately, the murder of Russell and Shirley Dermond, otherwise known as the Lake Oconee murders, are still very much unsolved. But someone, somewhere out there knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information on the murders of Russell and Shirley Dermond, please call the Putnam County Sheriff's Department at 706-485-8557. There is currently a $55,300 reward for any information that would lead to the capture of their killer. You can report any information anonymously. Anything you might know, even the smallest detail, could possibly break the entire case wide open. So please, if you know anything, give them a call. And that is it for this case. This is probably the longest one I've made so far. Sorry, thanks for sticking around if you're still here. As usual, um, if you want to see significantly shorter form content from me, uh, true crime content, you can head on over to my TikTok page. I have about 2.7 million followers over there. Um, and yeah, I've told like well over 2,000 uh, true crime stories. Um, I also tell like the worst ways people have died, worst freak accidents, um, other things like that too. So um, please go over there, give me a follow and uh, subscribe here too. Make sure you like this video because the more likes a video gets means the more it gets pushed. So if you if you watch it, just like it. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, if you have a case you would like me to cover on a future video, whether it be here on YouTube or on TikTok, you can send me an email to mikey at truecrimer.com. 
um, and just send me the name, where it happened and when, and I can add it to my list. But before you do that, in the description below, I have my link tree. Click on the link tree. It'll, you'll see a link that says uh, Crimer case list or something like that. Click on that list. It's about 4,200 names long. You can, um, it's pretty much alphabetical. So scroll through it. If you want to search, if you're on a computer, just hit control F, type in the name, and then you can find it that way. If you're on a phone, I believe if you hit the three dots and then hit uh, find and replace, type in the name and then the name should come up. If no name comes up, then send me an email and I will eventually cover that case. Please be very patient with me. I get lots of emails, so it may take me a while to respond. Um, and also, uh, I pick my cases at random. Um, so it could be tomorrow I cover your case, or it could be a month and a half or 17 years from now, if I'm still alive. So uh, yes, uh, just please be patient. And then finally, if you uh, like the shirt like this, says Crimer or Crew Member, or other shirts that have like my logo or other sayings, um, we sell hoodies and shirts. You can do rainbow font on some of them. We also sell mugs and a wine glass and other little things. Um, my merch store is also in the link tree below. We do ship internationally, so wherever you are in the world, Adam will ship to you. Adam is my very good friend who makes my merch himself, um, and he gets the supplies himself. Uh, don't worry, he gets paid for it uh, through the merch sales. <laughs> um, his information, by the way, is below. He's also on TikTok at uh, logically.me on, on there. Um, so give him some support because he's a wonderful person. Um, but yeah, the shipping internationally is really expensive, but there's nothing we can do about that but he will ship it, so. And that is it. So, until next time, we will see you for the next video. Ta-ta for now, Red Robin, yum. That is, no, no, that's wrong.